the Winter Park History Museum presents A Stroll Down Park Avenue, the podcast. It's September 30th, 2021, and today we're talking with Ann Sauerman, a longtime resident of Winter Park and also a community activist and, and involved in so many different organizations over the years, including the Winter Park History Museum. And um, we're videotaping this chat at the Winter Park History Museum offices on Knowles. And I'm joined with the executive director, Christy Grieger, and her assistant, Devorah Burgess. And the uh, videographer today is Yvonne Liss Dobrodin. I think I got that right. Okay, good. And so, um, Anne, welcome. We're awfully glad you're here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You've been such um, an observer of Winter Park for over the decades. And I think you've come to be a viewer of a lot of uh, uh, the activities in Winter Park, including the cultural activities, the political activities, and how the town has changed. And I wanted to start first with some background. And I wanted you to tell me about how your parents arrived in Winter Park. Yes, my mother, uh, Catherine Ship Morgan, was uh, actually born in Kissimmee. Her father was a Methodist minister, and that's where he had his church at the time. But when she was, I think before she, before he died, they moved back to Lake City, which is really where her family was from. And then he unfortunately died uh, when she was two years old of pneumonia, which a lot of people died up then. My mother was born in 1902. Uh, So she went to Florida State College for Women and majored in education. And she came to Winter Park, I think, around 1925 or 26, because she was allowed to teach before she graduated. And she would teach and then go to summer school. So it took her a little bit longer. She graduated in 1928. And she lived in a few different places here when she was teaching. She lived once in the apartment house where the powerhouse is, which was across the street from the Winter Park Grammar School. And one year she lived with Dr. and Mrs. Hotard. Right. On the where they live, lived on the Winter Park golf course. And I think she probably Although nobody had heard of babysitting in those days, but I think she helped take care of the children some. And she and Polly Hotard were very good friends. And then my grandmother, and she rented a house right about where, across from the Bush Science Center, when the road went through there, there were a lot of little wooden bungalows along Interlochen going towards Fairbanks. So she lived in a few different places while she was teaching. And my father was born in Kansas. His family had a farm, and they grew um, corn for feed. It was a big family. He had six sisters and two other brothers. And they all graduated from a little Methodist college called Southwestern in Leon, Kansas. But Daddy went on to um, Kansas State and got a degree in agriculture. And he helped run the farm, and then he did some oil speculating with his brothers. And then he came to Oviedo in um, 1927. He and his brother went into business with B.F. Wheeler, growing celery. And my mother had a friend who taught at the Winter Park Grammar School named Nell King, who lived in Oviedo, and she drove into Winter Park every day to teach. And one day she told mother that these two wonderful, handsome bachelors were there in (laughs) Oviedo, just up for grabs, I guess. (laughs) So she invited mother for dinner and bridge, and the two couples eventually 
my aunt and and Uncle George married and mother and daddy married. And mother and daddy married in 1932. And my mother did not want to live in Oviedo. It was a really small town then. <laughs> and uh, so they bought a house on Cortland Avenue near Loma so daddy could go to Oviedo every day. That worked out. And almost every Sunday when my sister and I were growing up, we'd go to Oviedo on Sunday afternoon to see Aunt Nell and Uncle George. And we'd be jumping up and down in the back of the car. We're going to see Aunt Nell and Uncle George <laughs> in Oviedo. <laughs> and her mother, Granny King, who lived in a wonderful house across from the Methodist Church there. It's still there. It's been a bed and breakfast and different things. But... Um, Granny King was there, and she had her hair up on her head, and she wore these white cotton, cotton dresses that I think came down to her ankles and black sort of Oxford, you know, women's Oxford shoes. We thought she was a very interesting person. So we'd go in and say hello to her, and then we'd go out and play. <laughs> what were the roads like out to Oviedo at that time? Well, it was a two-lane road. It was paved? It was paved. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I wanted to talk about, um, your early memories of growing up here and, um, because you were born here. I was, my sister and I were both born at home, 152 Cortland Avenue. <laughs> and the only thing I could ever get out of my mother was that Dr. Hotard said he thought babies should be born at home. But it may be that he didn't want to drive to Orlando. I don't know. <laughs> but we had uh, the house on Cortland. The property went all the way through to Sylvan Boulevard in the back. Mm -hmm. And there were orange trees back there. And we had a playhouse and a fish pond and a seesaw and swings. And it was a, it was a lovely place. And from that house, there was one across the street. And then there weren't any houses till you got to the corner of Paloma for a long time. So that entire swath of land between Cortland yes. and up to Aloma. There were there were houses from the lake coming up as far as um, our house and the one next to it, and then it was nothing. And the uh, where I live now on the corner of Cortland and Osceola, the vacant lot there was full of woods. And you, I didn't even realize the house I'm in now was over there. <laughs> you couldn't see it from where we lived until we went over to look at it before my parents bought it. And um, tell a story about how old were you when your parents bought the house that you now live in? I was six. You were six. They lived in the house on Cortland for 10 years. And then they bought it in nine, they bought the present house in 1942 from the Garys, Claude and Celia Gary. And he was maybe the first pharmacist in Winter Park. He had a drugstore. And then during the war, they went to California. He was in the Second World War. And um, I had always heard that they rented our house to Rollins for a sorority house one year. And I mean, people like Dick Sewell told me and Paul Harris told me they'd been over there when they were in college at Rollins to visit yes. girls. But I've never, I don't have any proof of it other than hearsay. <laughs> well, we touched on World War II and I know that you were involved in our last exhibition and you were nice enough to give us some interesting artifacts, including ration cards. Mm -hmm. And you um, mentioned the other day about purchasing food uh, during and after. And I was, how old were you when you, you when your, are your first memories of our involvement in the war? Well, I guess I was four when the war started, so I don't really remember that. I remember when it ended. Mm -hmm. I was 10, I think. We were just aware of uh, going to the movies. They always had the news reel, which we weren't really interested in seeing, but <laughs> we were aware of it. And I had an uncle, one of my mother's brothers, was in the Air Force, so we were aware of that. I have a lot of his V-mail 
letters that he wrote. And of course, the rationing, I didn't bother us much as children, but I have some letters when my grandmother would come to stay several months in the winter. I have one that she said she was bringing her ration book. Uh, so, And we had things like, um, without butter, we had the oleo that you mixed the coloring in. And then after the war, I just talked to my sister on the phone the other day to ask her if she remembered this, but they did sell some K-rations in the grocery store after the war was over. We don't agree on the size and shape of the container, but we both agree that it was metal and it was a dark military green color, and it had scrambled eggs and ham in it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> were the eggs already made? I think they were cooked and dried. I'm not sure, but we thought they were very good. <laughs> I don't know how we heated them up or what <laughs> happened, but we both remember that. <laughs> well, that's a telling memory. Um, the um, One of the things we were also chatting about a couple of days ago was the impact of the retail stores, particularly in your childhood. I think that they those stores on Park Avenue become important and they certainly do for generations. And the colony played a big role in World War II as far as not only an entertainment format and a a news format as far as what was going on internationally, but the Red Cross met there and there were all kinds of war efforts that were conducted out of the auditorium there. Do you have, your mother, I believe you said, worked for one of the... Well, she was with Bundles for Britain Mm -hmm. and probably with the Red Cross. I found a card. My sister had made a donation to the Red Cross, and of course we saved everything. Um, But the colony was so important. That was our main, well, not our main entertainment. We had a lot of things that we did, but we always went to the movie. and. It would repeat immediately afterwards, so sometimes we sat through it twice. <laughs> we really liked it. And um, I, my sister had, we had several friends, but there weren't a lot of children in Winter Park. And it was mainly a winter resort, and retired people came here for the winter, and then they would leave. I would say that air conditioning had the greatest impact on Winter Park, more so than Disney or anything else, because nothing would be here the way it is without air conditioning. So we based a lot of our games on movies that we saw. And I just looked at one of them on YouTube because my sister had her good friend was Ginger Nelson and my good friend was Sally Hazen, and sometimes the four of us, although we were two years apart in age, sometimes the four of us would play together. And this movie, House on 92nd Street, was about a German spy ring, and the front was a dress shop on 92nd Street in New York City. So we could combine dressing up, because we had a lot of wonderful clothes that our, we'd gotten from our parents. And then in the back room, which was our bathroom, but um, had a mirror door, which fit in nicely. We had all of our spy things. And I I brought this to show you later on. I have the little file box that we kept a file on everybody. And we fingerprinted and we used cap guns a lot. I'm sorry to say we were big on guns. And so we have cards with exploded caps taped on and... Then we would take the um, labels off of chewing gum and put them on and say they were something or other. I don't know. We were pretty inventive. And somewhere we have this tiny little vial of poison ivy poison, (laughs) which (laughs) we were going to use to make a spy talk if we had to. Anyway, that was one game we played. And another one, if we were outdoors, we were nurses in the South Pacific and we would go out in the canoe. And there was so much shoreline that was undeveloped. It was just like a jungle. And what lake was this? Well, it was really the Trisman's property. <laughs> lake, um, what is that? Lake Virginia, I guess. How fun. I love Osceola. I don't know. That's terrible after all these years. 
And then in our yard, we had a clump of bamboo and we hollowed that out. And so we would play in there. We weren't over at the Trismans all the time. <laughs> Sometimes we were at home. But we did base our games on on what we knew about the war. Sure. And I think the boys did that as well. Mm -hmm. That that was really, I hadn't thought about it, the war from a child's point of view, that that's, those were the games you played. And then, of course, the romantic movies were just wonderful because everybody was going off to war. And I mean, it sounds awful, but it seemed romantic to us. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm glad we, we touched on the colony because I think that the theater was such an important aspect of life here. Do you recall summers uh, on Park Avenue? Can you remember percentage wise how many shops were actually open? Well, I think all of the gift shops closed. And for a long time, most of the interesting stores were gift shops. Um, we went to Orlando to buy our clothes at Dixon and Ives and Yaldrew, which was always exciting to go over there. Um, but in the 50s, I think they began, began to get more dress shops on uh, Park Avenue. One I told you about that I remembered in Granita Court was called Bonnie Jeans. It was a small shop. Then, of course, Proctor's and... Um, Francis Slater's, there were so many after that. But up until that point, there weren't very many dress shops. I think Leedy's sold some clothes, but um, they were not high fashion kind of things. Uh, I, the reason I asked that was um, about where you, you purchased things or you brought it up, is that there was a big distinction between Winter Park and Orlando. And I would think in the 40s, Going to Orlando was a big deal. Yeah, it was. Did you know people from Orlando? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> we knew of them. <laughs> We'd read about them in the paper, you know. In the newspaper, every time somebody left town, they told where they were going and how long they were going to stay. Or if you had a party, you told who was there, who poured the tea, what the flowers looked like. A lot of details. Yes. But it would have been good if we'd had any burglars, but we didn't have any then, I don't think, because nobody locked their doors. <laughs> it is amazing the sort of detail the newspapers used mm -hmm. to carry. So everybody knew where everybody else was, whether they were in town or out of town. And I think the hotels supplied a lot of that information to the yes. newspaper, who had arrived, who was leaving. Mm -hmm. well, so... Um, the, the movie was the only thing going on downtown in the summertime. Yes. Um, the other things we did as children, the Coliseum, this would have been more during the school year rather than in the summer, but the Coliseum had a skating rink, and we had a lot of birthday parties, skating parties there. And we went to San Lando a lot. Our class always had an end-of-the-year party at San Lando. Mm -hmm. And um, and when the Central Florida Fair came, we had a day off from school to go to the fair. And that was exciting because it was full of school children and you saw maybe saw somebody you knew. I never cared much for any of the rides except the bump cars, but I don't like high places, so I didn't like the the Ferris wheel or anything like that. But it was fun to go. Absolutely. Um, so you went to um, Park Avenue Elementary. Was your mom still teaching then? No, she stopped teaching after she had, uh, well, my sister. Okay. And then you went on to Winter Park mm -hmm. High School. And you mentioned that in the 10th grade, you went to Stevens College because they had a program for, um, and this is, Stevens is in Missouri. Right. It was a preparatory. They used to have um, two years of high school and two of college originally. Mm -hmm. And then when I went, they had dropped it down to one year of high school. But when I, when we first went to Winter Park High, it was a junior high too, you know. So we went into seventh grade and that was a big deal. 
to go over there to school. And the new b- building had been built at that time. I mean, the the building on Huntington. Right, yeah. yeah. I can't remember when that opened. But um, so after you grad, then you went to Stevens for two years. I did. Then you transferred to the University of Florida. That's right. And tell us about meeting your husband there. Well, uh, when I got there, I had managed to not have very many courses in math, (laughs) (laughs) certain things. So I had to take a lot of comprehensive courses the first year. And I was always looking around at the other students to see what they were like. And I found one in one class that I sat next to. And he happened to be a roommate of my husband's. So this friend that I met in class asked me out and we double dated with my husband and another girl. Oh, I mean, he wasn't my husband, but Jim and another girl. And then after that, Jim started asking me out. But when I first met him before we went out, I think on uh, standing around on campus talking, he walked up and said, hello, Anne. And I said, how do you know who I am? And he said he had been looking at me. <laughs> so that wouldn't be proper now, of course, but I was flattered. <laughs> I think you might still be able to get away with that. Yeah. That's cute. So he was roommates with John Dye? he was he had Jim had gone a lot of uh, parents thought it was a good idea to send their children away to boarding schools that was the reason I went away my sister had gone to one in Connecticut for two years but my husband uh, everyone in his family had gone to George school which is outside of Philadelphia Mm -hmm. and um, he went there and then he went to Dartmouth And then he left school and went in the service for three years. So when he got back to the University of Florida, he was on the GI Bill. And these five young men rented a house together. And the youngest one who had not been in the Army was the one that I met first in class who introduced me to Jim. So David Weeks was one, and John Dye, and this John Fox that I knew, and Bill Albritton was a friend from Clearwater that uh, Jim had known, that they were all coming out of the service, and on very didn't have much money, <laughs> any of them. <laughs> but they had a fun house. It was not too far from where I lived. Where did... Um D- did Jim serve overseas? No, he had played football. He was a very good athlete. He had played football at Dartmouth, and then he played football in the service. And he had uh, he was airborne. He was a you know parachute jump out of planes. But every time he would get orders to go overseas in Korea, um, the commanding officer would change them and say, we need you to stay here for our morale and play football. So he played football. Doing it for the team. Yeah. (laughs) He did have some injuries that way too, though, but not gunshot or anything like that. (laughs) Right. Well, so you spent your young married life in Winter Park and... Well... Or did you? (laughs) We, most of it, we did. He had entered, he, he majored in business. His father had been in Citrus as well in Dunedin, Florida, but they had development down there much earlier than we did. And so they had sold their groves for real estate development. But his father was very active in the citrus industry and he was helped form the um, Citrus Mutual and he was on the Citrus Commission. But Jim didn't think he was interested in that at all and he majored in business. And he, they had interviews, you know, at school before, and he was hired by a company from Chicago called Old Republic. And so he went with them to sell credit life insurance to banks. So when we were first married, we lived in Chicago, and he traveled five days a week. And so that lasted for two years. And then we both wanted to live in Florida 
And there was no chance that they were going to move him even to the southeastern part of the country, it didn't seem. So we came back here and he interviewed a couple of places. And then my father, who was getting ready to slow down, asked him if he'd be interested in coming in with him oh. as a partner. So that's what he did. And he loved it. He always said he loved what he did. That's wonderful. Um, I was going to ask you about some of the people who lived here that you met over the years. And um, one of the um, one of the people I wanted to ask you about was Ida Woolley Brewer. Um, she was the daughter of Mr. Brewer that the Brewer Hill is named after, and they own quite a bit of land, just as some background to it. And I know you know this. Um, how did you know his daughter, Mr. Brewer's daughter? Eva. I didn't know her well, but Rachel Murrah and I used to play golf at the Little Winter Park Golf Course once a week. And then we'd go out for breakfast or lunch afterwards, whatever. Uh, and Ida played there probably every day. She was very accurate, <laughs> hitting the ball right down the course and into the hole. But I didn't really know her. Um, I was I, I knew Ida too, and I always thought it was interesting that she had stayed here in her unair conditioned home and lived fairly simple life. You know, but um, it was uh, that was a real throwback from the past that she was her age. I don't know what exactly that would have been, but that she was so active. She might have been in her eighties then. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are a number of clubs and organizations which you've been affiliated with over the decades, and I was wondering if you wanted to touch on any any aspects of. Uh, those organizations or what you've seen change in Winter Park that you find remarkable? The Winter Park History Historical Association has had a major change. When I first joined that, I don't know what year it was. We met at the Women's Club once a month. I think we had a program. And it was mostly people, I guess my age now, but then I was younger, who afterwards would sit around and talk about the old days. That was about it. Then Eleanor Fisher became very interested in having a museum, and Jim and I were involved with that. We looked at different properties every now and then when something was available. Some of them would have had to have been moved. And so that was, as time went on, I can't, I guess our, I, I'm trying to think what really changed. I guess getting the museum at the farmer's market made a big difference. And then, of course, Susan Schofield did a lot with the peacock ball and things like that. But Jim and I used to volunteer once a month at the museum which we enjoyed doing on, when the farmer's market was in, uh, in business then there at the farmer's, at the freight station. And when things weren't very busy, I would go to the file cabinet and pull out a transcript of an oral history and sit there and read it to him, which I loved doing. Some were really good and some were not as interesting. Right. <laughs> but a lot of it had to do with the interviewer. Um, what are the clubs now that you belong to? You, I know you belong to, you're on the board um, of several organizations. Not really so much. I have done things over the years. The first thing I got involved with was the Orlando Museum of Art and the Council of 101, which I did for a while. They, you work very hard when you're there. And I've done different things at church. I've been on, well, I was a circle leader, and then I've been on the board of trustees once, and the um, what used to be called the leadership council, I think, things like that. 
This is the Methodist Church. Right. My parents were married in the church, and I was, of course, baptized there and confirmed. So at this point, I believe I'm the, I've am the. i been a member longer. I'm not the oldest person there, but I've been a member longer than anybody, I believe. So I've seen a lot of changes there. I came when I was looking at this little file box. We had just picked up anything we could find around the house, I guess, and there were some mimeographed cards to donate to a new parsonage. I don't know what year this was, but some of the choices were 50 cents a week. <laughs> so things have changed. <laughs> they have indeed. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Uh, any kind of observations you might have had about how the community has changed? When I was growing up, as I said, it was primarily a winter resort. And my parents, many of their good friends were winter visitors. And my mother was very active in the women's club. She was the president and she was in her 40s, which was rather unusual. because Most of them were older than that. And mother was in everything. She was uh, a trustee of the library. She was a trustee. She helped raise money for the Winter Park Memorial Hospital. She was very good at fundraising. And um, they had wonderful dinner parties and bridge parties, and they'd dress up formally for these parties at people's houses or at the hotels. So that changed a lot when air conditioning came and people didn't come and stay in the hotels or in their houses the way they used to do as much. I mean, a new generation did not do the same things that the other one had. So that changed a lot. And primarily it's just growth, I guess. And the fact that you don't know everybody I used to be able to tell you who lived in every house, even if I didn't know who they were, perhaps not every house, but the ones that you were interested in. (laughs) (laughs) But now I look at any list of people, I don't know anybody. Well, I don't know the movers and shakers, let's put it that way. I don't know if that's true, but (laughs) I will let that pass. Um, You sit on a very important board in town, and um, uh, that's kind of a board that represents really, um, it's a a long-time tradition of giving to the community and providing um, support in lots of different ways to different organizations. And uh, I I think that's, uh, you know, a credit to you. Well, you're talking about the Morse Foundation. That's and right. The McCains, Jeanette, Genius McCain, and her husband were very generous to the city as their as her grandfather had been. And they have never competed with other organizations in a fundraising way. So it's given them the opportunity to really do a lot of good work here, I think. And I believe the museum is a beautiful asset. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, Anne, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, Let's see. I don't think so. I'm just very fortunate to have lived in Winter Park so long. And I've lived in three houses on the same street. Somebody introduced me at a neighborhood party telling that, and the person said, do you ever feel like you've missed something? (laughs) And I said, well, I have been out of town, but I'm always happy to come home again. (laughs) (laughs) On occasion, I've left. left But I have a beautiful view of Lake Mycel, and uh, it's just wonderful. It's a beautiful home. The story of that you refer to is that your folks bought that home. Mm-hmm. You grew up in that home. Then you moved on another place on Cortland, correct? Mm-hmm. On Cortland Avenue. 
And then what year did you move back? You were able to buy back the house. Yes. Your my, my, house. my father died in 1975, and my mother loved the house, but she didn't want to live there alone. And even though we were across the street, she still didn't feel comfortable there. So she bought a condominium at the Cloisters, and she sold the house to us, and that was 1975. So I had been there from 1942 to 1957 when I got married. Of course, I was away at school some of those years. And then I came back. 1975, and I've been there since then. I don't know how many years does that add up to? It adds up to most of your lives. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't mind saying I'm 85 years old. I used to, when I was 80, I couldn't stand to say the word 80 for about a year, but now I've gotten <laughs> over that. <laughs> but I do love the house, and I love historic preservation, and I was able, with some help from a one of the professors at Stetson to get my house listed on the National Register. And of course, first of all, I had it on the city register, which is the most important thing. But I thought if I had two plaques on the front, it might be harder to hit it with that wrecking ball someday. So. <laughs> well, the rest of us thank you for that, because that's quite an ordeal getting it on the historic record. Well, if you have somebody who knows what to do, and he did a wonderful amount of research, it's so interesting. Oh, my bad. Yeah, I gave you all the copy yeah. of it. You have it somewhere, but yeah. I haven't read it lately either. <laughs> well, Anne, it's been lovely talking to you this morning, and we thank you for coming. And um, we also thank you for being such a great supporter, a continued supporter and member of the Winter Park History Museum. Thank you for asking me.